Hello, I'm Marcia Kavanaugh. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, if we did not have New Year's, we might not remember much about the past. The holiday serves up memories in approachable 12 month sized packages. And we'll take advantage of the offering tonight by looking at the year's top five stories in politics, crimes, big projects not completed, and even some wild card stories. Among our acquaintances not to be forgotten are tonight's Informed Sources. Errol Laborde, producer of Informed Sources. There you go, Errol. <laughs> Stephanie Grace, columnist, the New Orleans Advocate. Don Ostrom, Channel 12's Future Watch reporter. And Mike Perlstein, investigative reporter, WWL-TV Channel 4. And so you guys are going to sort of recap for us some of these stories in these, uh, in, in these topics of criminal, um, criminal justice stories, et cetera. And we're going to start with you, Mike, in, in just that category. What did you find were the top stories? Well, we start with the changing of the guard um, in Jefferson Parish with a new sheriff in town, Joe mm -hmm. Lepinto. He had been appointed as the interim by Newell Norman and won a hotly contested election over John Fortunato, who had also been a top Newell Norman lieutenant, right. but um, did not get the nod from the former powerful sheriff, Newell Norman. Very and, powerful and very popular sheriff in right, Jefferson Parish. And that almost became a little bit of a referendum on Parish President Mike Yenny, who at one point during the campaign, uh, Fortunato said that uh, you know, he would support Yenny and that really turned what had been a very close race yeah. into not a close race at all. And so Lepinto now enjoys uh, you know, what is always argued to be the most powerful political position in Jefferson Parish. And one of those um, positions that incumbents enjoy for as, pr pretty much as long as they want to serve in that office. Right. Uh, that brings us to uh, number four on our list, which is in New Orleans. Uh, not what changed, but what stayed the same, mm -hmm. which is police chief Michael Harrison retained by newly elected Mayor Latoya Cantrell. When she took office in May, there was a lot of speculation that she might be angling to do you know a national search and replace him uh, that has not happened he's lasted the year and really there are no signs that she is you know moving toward um, you know looking at other candidates and there are a lot of reasons for that you know one is that they're under the New Orleans Police Department is under a federal <laughs> consent decree mm -hmm. which has been shepherded under his watch rather successfully uh, the federal judge in that case Susie Morgan has confidence in the administration as it stands, and so that uh, really works in Michael Harrison's favor. All right. uh, moving on, so um, another consent decree, number three on our list, is over the Orleans Justice Center, formerly known as OPP, Orleans Parish Prison, and they're the opposite of NOPD. They're not doing well under their consent decree at all. There's no end in sight. The, the jail continues to be plagued by violence, contraband, there's been drug overdoses, drug overdose deaths, mm -hmm. uh, a suicide. There's been While a you're in prison, go ahead and get whatever you need. <sighs> want. Incredible. You know, there was even a arrest made of someone trying to break into the prison with contraband. So, <laughs> right, to climb over the wall um, with contraband. That's part of the, the idea that there was supposed to be direct supervision in this facility. Well, there's direct supervision, but they continue to have trouble hiring enough guards for the facility. There's you know, massive turnover. The, the job for, of guard uh, pays very, very mm -hmm. poorly. They have a real difficult time you know, keeping a workforce. So what's the latest on the consent decree? With, with, you know? Well, um, so we did have a change in what they call the compliance director. He's really the person mm -hmm. who runs the jail instead of the elected sheriff, Marlon Gussman. Uh, it was Gary Maynard. Um, <clears throat> you know, that has changed to Darnley Hodge simply because there was basically a no confidence mm -hmm. vote um, by the federal judge. In that case, Lance Afric with Gary Maynard, the you know, severe problems continuing, uh, not making the benchmarks. And so it will be interesting to see when uh, Judge Afric's patience runs out. Now on to number, uh, number two, two on our list is the St. Tammany case of Jack Strain, the former sheriff, is clearly in the crosshairs of a major federal investigation. We've seen a bill of information, which is almost always a signal of cooperation and an upcoming guilty plea of his two top lieutenants who ended up running uh, a 
work release program that was launched by the sheriff when he took it out of you know, parish control and privatized it, they are accused of giving kickbacks to uh, Jack Strain. And that investigation has expanded to include possible sexual abuse of teenagers, and we look for that you know, to really heat up in the coming years. There's a little right. side note to that um, story on the list, which is all the, the Bill of Information in that case coming to fruition in federal court has happened under the watch of the new permanent U.S. Attorney, Peter Strasser. It's been a while since the meltdown of Jim Letton, and finally there's now a you know, Senate-approved permanent U.S. Attorney Peter Strasser. Okay, number one on your list. Number one. The New Orleans Police Department uh, and City of New Orleans is enjoying what is a decades low, decades long low in both homicides and shootings. Uh, very welcome news. The um, you know success is attributed by the police chief Michael Harrison to new technology, crime cameras all over the city, uh, an aggressive enforcement unit called the Tiger Unit cracking down on serial robbers and shooters. Um, what we've really seen, if you really break down the numbers, is a dramatic decrease in the last six months of the year. Single-digit homicides each month over the last several months. Obviously, we hope that continues, right. but very good trend, and right now it would be considered a short-term success. If it continues you know, months into the new year, then it would be looked at as a, a real long-term success, hopefully sustainable. Exactly. That we do hope definitely that it will be sustained. Thanks That's a lot, right. Mike. Okay, Stephanie, your choice um, on political, political stories. stories. Uh, that's that's got to be hard to choose five. It is, usually. Um, I will say, number five, I was thinking when Mike was talking about Joe Lepento and how powerful the Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office is, Harry Lee once declined to run for governor because he said he had more power as sheriff. <laughs> Somebody else declined to run for governor this year, John Kennedy, U.S. Mm -hmm. Senator John Kennedy. And this was a big story, even though it's really a 2019 story in some ways because the governor's race is in 2019. John Kennedy, the U.S. Senator, has been hinting and delaying and really keeping people in suspense until December as to whether he would run against John Bell Edwards. He's a very vocal critic, always has been. And the issue really, the question really is, is John Bell Edwards going to have a serious, powerful challenger or is he going to have some unknown challengers? And John Kennedy was the last of the people who really would have been a big name mm -hmm. to run against him. So John Bell Edwards enters election year in, in good shape. I'm pretty happy. People, Republicans, on the other hand, are pretty mad at John Kennedy. <laughs> um, number four, upheaval in the Secretary of State's office. This is an office that, when things are going well, doesn't get a lot of attention. Things did not go well this year, so it did. Tom Shedler was the longstanding Secretary of State, uh, had to resign. Uh, this was really the first Me Too case in Louisiana politics. There was an employee that he was harassing, even really stalking, if you kind of look at the details. There was, she filed a lawsuit. He tried to hold on, but he was forced to resign. His deputy took over, a man named Kyle Ardwin, and immediately <coughs> said he would not run in the special election to replace Kyle, uh, Tom Shedler. And then qualifying happened, and all of a sudden, there was Kyle Ardwin <laughs> saying, turns out I am running, which um, made all the people, other people running furious. There was an election. Kyle Ardwin ended up winning. Um, so he's now the Secretary of State until next year when there's the regular election, and he's already having some controversies. He had chosen some new voting machines. Uh, the governor's office has basically disqualified the bid. Uh, there were some bidding issues so that we're not going to get new voting machines in time for the next election. Of course, this office oversees elections mm -hmm. at a time when election integrity and election security is a huge issue. So it'll be interesting to see what he does. Number three. Number three. Uh, Unanimous jury constitutional amendment. This is an issue that really came out of nowhere. J.P. Morrell sponsored a constitutional amendment. He's a state senator from New Orleans, basically saying Louisiana was one, until now was one of the two states in the country that did not require unanimous juries for conviction. And it was considered a long shot, something of a cause for social progressive, <coughs> social justice types. And it really caught on. There was some reporting that we did at The Advocate, my colleagues, on the kind of racist roots of this law and how even the application today 
tends to hit African Americans harder. And that newspaper series was was quite you know timely. It really got traction. It was widely read, um, was. cited by J. P. Morrell and others. And others in the legislature. And what was interesting is not just people like J. P. Morrell, but a lot of Republicans. It became an issue where there was a real bipartisan consensus, and you had people who were kind of very conservative Republicans, real constitutionalists, saying. You know what's the the worst form of government overreach? Locking you up. So you really had some interesting people working together, and it's almost the same coalition that worked on criminal justice the year before. And it, it's I, I just find it. And then of course there was a public referendum, and mm -hmm. it was approved quite handily. And to me, it's really kind of an example of what happens when people lay down their swords and don't kind of retreat to their camps and are willing to work together and, <laughs> and maybe, just be human and be human <laughs> and appreciate and say, "I'm coming at it from this direction. You're coming at it from this direction, but we can agree." So okay. more and of that, please. More moving over to uh, number two, and that number wasn't necessarily the case of what you're talking the about. The opposite, right. the exact opposite. This was another big issue in the legislature, really for two and a half years, and it was how to dig out of the financial hole that Governor John Bell Edwards in the legislature inherited. And special, se special session after special session, at one point there were some high hopes that we could have real reform of the tax system. That did not happen. What we ended up do it, having is real partisan fights over fractions of pennies of sales tax, which is the easiest tax to approve. It's the one the Republicans wanted, John Bell Edwards wanted income tax. But they did it, they finally did it. And um, at the end of the two and a half year process, you kind of looked around and realized this is what we've been doing all this time. And just and really quickly, could we be talking about that again in 2019? Maybe because there is some feeling that because now more revenue is coming than they expected, mm -hmm. there is some to roll back that tax. I, yeah. I don't know that it's going to happen. Okay. I think everyone will leave it alone. But we'll be talking about Let's it. Let's talk about still 2018. Okay. Number one. 2018, and this is actually. Kind of a 2017 story because Governor, um, I'm sorry, Mayor Latoya Cantrell, of course, was elected in 2017. Mm -hmm. She took office in 2018 along with the new city council. There was that long six-month transition mm -hmm. period where really not a lot happened. So, so now we have the city has its first female mayor and a very aggressive city council, and they're working things out. We're starting to get a sense of what issues they care about, how they'll work together. Latoya Cantrell, of course, one of the first things, she, one of the things she campaigned on was getting rid of the tariff of cameras. So there was a mm. lot of anticipation how that would work out. We're also seeing her really do some of the populist things she campaigned on. One of them is really going after the state, trying to get some money that is generated in New Orleans and goes to the state, trying to claw some of that back, which is something that Mitch Landry or previous mayors have tried and have not been successful mm -hmm. on, but she's making a big push to do it. So that's going to be an interesting story to watch. For 2019. Okay. For 2019. Thanks a lot, Stephanie. Don, over to you. We have some big projects out there that are ongoing or haven't even gotten off the ground. Well, we've sat here on this table and talked over the years about the projects that will be complete in time for the city's 300th birthday. Well, check your <laughs> calendars, everybody. The 300th birthday is just about finished and a lot of these projects are not. But that does not mean they're all completely dead in the water. However, number five, starting with number five, Jazzland, or Six Flags New Orleans, or mm -hmm. that site in the east. It's a perennial favorite. It's going to be a sports field. It's going to be a sporting goods store. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a whatever. It's still going to be a nothing. Um, mm -hmm. The city's told me that uh, they're conducting an economic assessment of the site and the surrounding mm -hmm. area, and they will move forward appropriately when that survey is complete. Um, that, so we, we can read into that nothing, nothing, and nothing. It still sits out there. We were talking really before the show, what about wind farms out there or solar energy mm -hmm. or converting it just to the green space mm -hmm. and, the, and the, who knows? I think um, one of the so problems, you know, it goes in hand in hand with the lack of development in eastern New Orleans in general. In general. So retail mm -hmm. and some of these other projects really haven't gotten off the ground. They're just not the Since Katrina, really. rest of the right. development and in that area. It's an incredibly expensive site for the city to maintain, just in terms of grass cutting and, and keeping wild animals at bay. Um, so Jazzland might make it on our list for the city's 400th birthday. <laughs> um, number four on the list, Convention Center Expansion, the upriver expansion. Uh, proposed 1,200-room hotel it was originally supposed to be a big hotel and an entertainment and economic district and a new neighborhood by the power plants and that end of the convention center. It's still not anything. It was supposed to be connected, however, with a reconfigurated, re, is that even a word? <laughs> a reconfigured 
Convention Center Boulevard, more pedestrian friendly, taking the road from four lanes down to two lanes with a people mover and parks. That project is actually underway um, on Convention Center. It's all dug up now. It's yes. all dug up and it is a mess to drive around there mm -hmm. right now, but it is happening. As for the hotel, Mayor Cantrell is involved. They're mm -hmm. taking another look at, at the tax financing packages for that. It could be a while there. Number three on the list, Charity Hospital. The state has picked a developer for that site. That's as far as we've gotten <laughs> there. However, the Greater New Orleans Foundation, parallel to the process of the state picking a developer, took a whole look at the neighborhood there. Because in addition to the one million square feet of space in Charity Hospital. There's also 850,000 square feet of space in the old VA. There's room for a whole lot to happen. Mm -hmm. It's the, really the last part of downtown that's truly not done or not finished, hasn't been touched. Um, so the Downtown Development District is involved, the Greater New Orleans Foundation is involved, involved the state's involved. At some point in the future, we should see a lot of different types of housing, parks, open space there. Um, and, that, and that proposal for charity itself, it was a, a, a mixed use type mixed of proposal. Mixed use, absolutely mixed okay. use. Um, number two on the list, World Trade Center and the hotel there. Um, the lawsuits are finished. The work has begun. Const there are construction tents up. And that project should be complete by the end of 2020. If you look at the images of the um, site, it really will transform the river there as the hotel will come out kind of with a new build that goes up five stories, the rooftop pool, and just a t totally different feel to the World Trade Center that has been empty for so long. Right. And number one on the list, the new airport where people were supposed to be flying in to celebrate the 300th birthday. After many delays, uh, the new terminal is set to open in May. The terminal will be finished with lots of new restaurants and shops and make it feel much more like the larger airports that mm -hmm. we're competing against. What won't be finished in May is the road access to the airport. That's not until about 2021. From the interstate. From the interstate. Mm -hmm. So you will have to go on surface level streets for mm -hmm. a little bit. To and get will there, into there the still airport. be access from Airline Drive there should to be. come from that way? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's a big one, the airport, definitely. Yes. A long time in the making, too, because so many uh, leaders have tried to get a new airport. So we right. will have one. And still undetermined is what will happen with the old airport mm -hmm. when the new ar airport opens. All righty, Don. Thanks if a lot. If you look at the old convention center area in the area around Fulton Street, that was all things that were built in preparation for the 84 World Fair. Mm -hmm. So you can see at least these things kind of create activity and then you see like the residual benefits, mm -hmm. you know, right. sometimes stimulate, many years later. Stimulate some other uses, yeah. right. definitely. And then the new ferry terminal down there too at some right. point. Mm -hmm. So a lot going on. Okay, Errol, to you goes the wild card. Well, for years of have been hearing about the tricentennial. Well, the tricentennial came and it's almost gone. <laughs> uh, I don't know what everybody thought about it. If you're expecting parades every night and fireworks and a big bang out there. That didn't happen, but it's probably not necessarily where the tricentennial is supposed to be. Uh, I do think for the institutional levels, there were people like the Historic New Orleans Collection and, and NOMA that did things. Even though, I gotta say, this station did 200 mm -hmm. tricentennial minutes. 200, all right? 200, well, yes. uh, Which was a, a year-long project. And so there was a lot of learning that went on with the activity. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so if, if, if you're expecting that, if you're expecting some scholarship and all that, then I think it was, it, it was more successful. It probably lost a little steam after May once Mayor Mitch Landry, when, um, when his term was finished, because I think he was the one that was excited about it. I think a lot of activity was kind of sort of like stacked up to the, uh, mm -hmm. to the first part. I will say that uh, San Antonio also had its tricentennial this past year, and I heard nothing about it uh, uh, during the year. and so. We know that New Orleans got great national press. You know, it was rated like the, the top travel destination of, uh, in the world for the year because of that. And so in that sense, uh, did a lot of good. Number four was, uh, well, the death of Tom Benson. And I think we saw, it, it was, uh, uh, he was very much respected. And there was a, a beautiful ceremony that went on at, at the cathedral and, and uh, a lot of honor and reverence for, uh, for Tom Benson. But I think the other part of the story was the smoothness with which the transition was made. They were prepared for it at the Saints office. And it could have very easily become a crisis, crisis like, what's going to happen to the Saints now? What's going to happen to the Pelicans? And from the very beginning, they made it clear that everything is in order, that the transition is, is in place. And, the, and there never was any, any sort of dissension, especially with the family problems that there had been in, in the years before. 
that that never became an issue, and so it was a very, very smooth transition. And Gail um, Benson's been very visible since then, certainly. Yeah. Um, number three, downtown redevelopment. A lot of uh, old buildings are being converted into new buildings and or new, newer uses. A lot of them are hotels, uh, which mm -hmm. is sort of uh, uh, fun to see. The uh, people may remember going to pay the electricity bills at at the Nopsy building, New Orleans Public Service. Now it's a hotel. Uh, the Nopsy Hotel, it's a very elegant hotel. Um, the old um, New Orleans Hotel on Canal Street, you have the chain actually called B, the B Hotels. Why they call it the B, I don't know. Okay. And so now it's called B on Canal Street, right? Mm -hmm. And so you're seeing more and more of, uh, of that. And, and of course, once you have it, you have restaurants and you have bars. But the main thing is you have nightlife because when it was just, a, if it was accounting firms and it's closed from 5 o'clock Friday to, uh, uh, to 8 o'clock Monday, and now you have weekend life. And so I think that's really good for the environment uh, of, of downtown. Um, number two, Avondale. Uh, for years, they've been waiting for something to happen. And finally, a lot of people worked hard on this, uh, on putting together a deal. It's going to be a, a complex of a lot of different activities, but it's going to bring a lot of economic energy back to the West Bank in a place that, that, that really needs it. So it's really probably the single most important economic story of the year. And then number one, uh, sex abuse revelations. Uh, more of them, we heard of uh, I mean, most of them were in the church. The, the, the bishop, I think, did what he could to try to present the, the, the image of openness and to talk about it. And there were two lists that, that were released in different months. But also, we also heard in other industries too, uh, um, the restaurant industry, there was a, there was more of that, and so that becomes an ongoing story. Uh, well, and of course nationally too, the whole yeah. me, the, the Me Too movement, but certainly with the sex abuse stories that it, you have there. Especially in New Orleans with its, in, with its Catholic culture. Right, it, it means yeah. It's just a, it, it, just it means more. Everybody really, knows um, somebody who was mm -hmm. one of these priests and, yeah, so many personal stories. Yeah, very, yeah. very disturbing and shocking story and a, a saddening one to so many people. Yeah. Harking back to, to Tom Benson, um, you know, I guess the greatest tribute is the fact that the Saints are having a fantastic <laughs> season, <laughs> you know. They are. Um, and it's kind of sad. I've thought to myself, man, if only Tom Benson could have seen this. Mm -hmm. right? and, uh, and, and yeah, they were having that. And, and, and it's purely his legacy because he inherited a team that wasn't very good. And there were some seasons when it got even, even worse and people were very, very critical of him. But he kind of held the course and, uh, and he rebuilt it. And by all accounts, I mean, he, he left a really steady administration. So I don't think anyone's really worried about... Uh, um, the condition of the franchises. Probably the Pelicans is a little bit more troubled than the Saints are mm -hmm. just financially. <laughs> but in, in, in retrospect, it's probably a good thing that they're owned by the same company and that they can kind of pool their resources right. together. Well, the continuity of the Saints, you know, from Tom to Dale is a tribute to that he kept, you know, the, the brain trust that had been with him for mm -hmm. decades, mm -hmm. starting with Dennis Lausch. Uh, you know, they still mm -hmm. remain as now the top lieutenants to Gil Benson. Okay, and we want to see them go all the way, <laughs> indeed. All right, now it is time, folks, for your predictions. Okay, so these, are, these are predictions. Okay. Uh, What's going to be a state election year, and I predict that all of the incumbents are going to be reelected, including the governor. Okay, remember that as we move into the political season next year. Stephanie? Uh, we talked about the fiscal cliff finally being resolved. Uh, John Bell Edwards has said that his priority for his last term and his last year in his first term is a teacher pay raise. And I predict that will happen, but not without a lot of political fighting, because really most people, Democrats and Republicans, are for it. Teachers haven't had a pay raise mm -hmm. since Kathleen Blanco, when, when she brought them up to the Southern average, they've now dropped behind. But there's already a lot of maneuvering over how much is it just teachers or is it support staff and how to pay for it? How to pay for it? I mean, there's there's dispute right now over what revenue the state revenue. is going to have there, to work with already. There's a fight at the revenue estimating conference, which usually goes smoothly, and it's the leadership of the House, which has been very confrontational with John Bell Edwards, refusing to recognize revenue that could be put towards these teacher pay raises. So that's a story that's ongoing. So are you predicting that the confrontation will continue to I, Yes, but it will happen? resolve in, eventually there will be a raise of some sort, but not without a lot of um, 
politics as usual. Easy, <laughs> easy prediction. There will be friction between the, the Democratic governor <laughs> the and the Republican governor. legislature. In an election year, yes. <laughs> and the regular session starts when in 2019? Uh, Is it in March? March. Yeah, it's in the spring sometime. It's in the spring, March or April. Okay, it's okay. a fiscal session, so it's a little shorter. Yeah. So. Okay, okay. Thanks, Steph. Don, over to you. I predict that uh, it will be a while before we have our weekends to just do whatever because <laughs> we will be watching the Saints long into the season. It, it just feels, the year feels like it felt in 2009, 2010. And I predict they're going to be in Atlanta for the Super Bowl. Okay, that's okay. a good prediction. I wonder if you were going to go for the full prediction of how they're going to do, how they're oh, gonna yeah. do in that game. They, they will have home field advantage in Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta should mm -hmm. they get there. And I think the home team will win. And, and, and your argument's been made that when they win, being in Atlanta, it would be a po it would be possible for people from New Orleans to fly back to New Orleans at night to, to get down into the quarter for and the celebrate. celebration. <laughs> to still have <laughs> that celebration. Catch that one hour flight. <laughs> Uh, We're reminiscent of that one in 2010 because yes. that was a big celebration. That was a, that I, I walked into the French Quarter mm -hmm. that night with um, millions of my finest friends, and it was a blast. It <laughs> Screaming who dad, all of you all were. Okay, Mike. Okay, well, uh, I'm not even going to go with the Saints because I don't want to jinx any, uh, you know, there are plenty of predictions out there about how well they're going to do. But turning to the Pelicans, the other you know, professional sports franchise, there's all kinds of buzz if anyone follows the NBA on whether Anthony Davis, the superstar and perennial MVP candidate, is going to remain with the team. That trade deadline comes in the first week of February mm -hmm. of next year. And I predict he's staying. Um, while everyone wants to, you know, create rumors about Los Angeles or the Boston Celtics and going LeBron after. James has been doing it himself. Yeah, absolutely. Rumors. But everyone's talking about it except for Anthony Davis, mm -hmm. who continues to say he just wants to win here in New Orleans. I'm going to take him at his word. Okay, mm -hmm. we're going to take you at your word, too, and hope that you're right about that. Definitely. Stephanie, I just want to go over to you just before sure. we have to wrap it up regarding, you know, the mayor's effort to try to claw back some yes. of these state monies. Do you think maybe she'll have a better chance? I mean, she really, really seems to be bound and determined. She, she keeps is. coming up with ideas. And she's setting up a political structure to do it. She's using her PAC and she has hashtags and she's really trying to bring the citizens into it. Now, again, the governor has thrown some cold mm -hmm. water on it and that's unfortunate for her. They're both Democrats, of course, and he's expecting a lot of votes in New Orleans. But, you know, it's tough. It's This mm -hmm. legislature does not want to do this and it's going to take some real persuasion. Well, she I doesn't. Don't know. She doesn't seem to be taking no for an answer. She definitely right does not. It okay. really seems to be a top priority for It'll her. It'll be interesting to see what happens in 2019. Thanks a lot, guys, for being here. Thank you all for joining us, and we wish you a very happy, happy, and safe new year. And we'll see you in the new year for Informed Sources next Friday. Have a good evening.